use as an example. And so they took my father's friend, Gordon, my mother and father, lynched him, burned him in front of a mob of people. This was a classroom uh, situation for them. And then sold the bones mm -hmm. of the beast. It was then that I got up and told my mom and daddy, I'm leaving here. It ain't much. <laughs> no, my mother insisted that we get out of there. Because my daddy was what literally was, could be called a badass nigga. And there were numbers of those. And they all eventually had to leave because they would have been dead unless they wanted to die. And so we came to Chicago with this first great migration. And the first great migration, uh, not just from natural increase, but there were more immigrants, I mean more migrants who came to the North as people like my mother and dad came, were met at the train station or the bus station and told how you behave in the big city. <laughs> Don't talk too loud. Don't walk, uh, you know. If you spit, go to the edge of the sidewalk. Don't spit on the streets or in the grass. Uh, don't walk on the grass. You see, don't walk on the grass because grass meant much less in the South, particularly the rural South, than it did. It was not an ornamental thing. It was in the way. So here you have another culture, but you have people here who can help to educate you about that culture. Now, I'm, I'm generalizing not just Chicago. This was happening in our large cities across the country. What year did your parents come to Chicago? 1919, right after the race ride. The race ride was in August, I mean in July of 1919. It gives some idea of how desperate they were to leave the South. They knew there had been a race ride. Mm -hmm. They continued to come. They still came to Chicago in August of 1919. So I have been, uh, I can actually walk from where I live now 4906 Drexel Boulevard, to every house of vacant lot where I've ever lived in Chicago. Now, therefore, in some way I have, and then I disobeyed my mother and father. I hung out with the hoodlums, as well as the so-called nice people. My brother did, my sister did. But the hoodlums were so much more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, guys like Red Fox, you know, and that, that kind of thing, you know, I hung around with a guy like Nat King Cole, uh, Dorothy Donegan. They weren't hoodlums, but they were, you know, they were different because it was not their attitude about education was somewhat different. It wasn't, they wasn't that they didn't say you shouldn't get it. It was the style in which they carried it. Well, that was an exciting creative style as far as I was concerned. And so uh, when uh, uh, I uh, was persuaded by my children, my late son and my daughter, that I ought to be writing something, and then I was uh, given an opportunity through De DePaul University and a couple of uh, foundations to begin, and then I was approached by Northwestern to <coughs> really get serious. Uh, I began to do that. Now, these conversations are very, uh, informed and they have no judgmental no judgment about whether it's right or wrong or anything uh, it's a conversation uh, that maybe if you were in the next room you say well I wonder what they're talking about and you listen a little closer because it's like kind of a little bit like gossip uh, I on that I, I kind of loosely operating and somebody says say something that's interesting I said hmm can you imagine that goodness gracious uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and it is taking the idea and pressing it to the person to open up mm. more and more and more let them spill it out without judging it and that's where you scholars can come in. But it has been a very 
I wish I had brought a copy of Bridges of Memory. That here we see in that first generation, my generation, it, uh, urged on by their parents, grandparents, and whoever, a group of people who were determined, despite all of the disadvantages of race, confinement, that they're going to make it. I think if I did a statistical analysis of the children of that of my generation, my father and mother's generation, but we couldn't quit school. I tried. <laughs> mama said, no, you ain't going to do that. My dad said, do what your mama said. <laughs> <laughs> and so if we quit school, you got to go to work. Well, being lazy, I didn't want to go to work, so I <laughs> kept going to school. So. The point was that if I took, and I was with some of this uh, a funeral the other day. I was at a funeral of one of my friends who had, we'd been friends for more than 70 years. In fact, I looked around the funeral parlor, and most of us had, you know, had been friends. Some of us had been <coughs> kindergarten, you know, some of us, and we're in our 80s, I'm 85. Uh, and I thought, where, you know, look at the success, <coughs> not millionaire. But all of those people, are, they play golf all the time. They got two homes. They're, all of their children are either in business or going to college. And they brag about it. <laughs> because like my mom and daddy bragged when I was going to the university. You know, my mom at first, they used to call my, I wouldn't go to school, I was playing around. And, <laughs> and uh, all my mother's friends from uh, Florence would be calling up because almost everybody from Florence, Alabama went to school. And they would call it up there in comp competition with one another. Mm -hmm. You know how these ladies can be, can, you know, can mm -hmm. compete on another level. And so <laughs> they'd call my mother, Maddie. Uh, Walton, <coughs> Walton is uh, going to the uh, University of Illinois, and my brother was one of the University of Illinois too. And he is getting ready to go to, uh, to uh, uh, graduate school. And he'd talk about, what is TD doing? <laughs> I'd be out late, having an old drunk. I'd be home. <laughs> Mama, Mama would be waiting up, reading the paper. When you going back to school? When you going back to school? When you going back to school? It was easy to stop that nagging woman from, you know. <laughs> but easy to go to school. <laughs> well, she was determined. Then when, after I did my little graduate work, after I came back from the Army, when I couldn't say I wasn't going back to school anymore because I had GI Bill. Then I went over to your school, uh, under Sinclair Drake and, and, and uh, others over there. My mother called her picket horse. Let me tell you something. You know, <laughs> TD is going to the University of Chicago. <laughs> she got over. Because <laughs> at that time, in my generation, few of them were going to the University of Chicago at the graduate or the doctorate. So, the competition, that's the point, not so much the competition with Tim Black. The competition in the pressure of the people of that first great migration is something that needs to be understood. It's similar to that of other groups in the first generation. It's very similar when you look at it anthropologically or sociologically or historically. So uh, that is a very interesting because in Chicago, at least, the first 12, as far as I can know, as far as I know the first 12 black uh, uh, CPAs in the country came out of the segregated narrow area. Why? Because it was segregated and all of the, the concentration of the talent was there as well with these highly motivated people. And so you had several millionaires in this period of time. And it was the incentive of that kind of thing, success, that created a John H. Johnson. John H. Johnson was working for people who were already millionaires. He could look around and say, oh, they got, maybe I can do that too. It was the incentive, I just left the thing about the basketball called the Harlem Globetrotters. The Harlem Globetrotters did not come from Harlem. They came from the Black Belt of Chicago, went to Phillips High School. Abe Sabastian called them a hard blow trial because of we Chicagoans have an inferiority complex about New York. So Harlem would be more attractive than calling them the, the uh, Savoy Big Pie. 
And so uh, all of those guys came out of Winterfell, but they were driven. They were not Dukos. They were intelligent young men and women who could not get into the big leagues of basketball or baseball at that time. They created their own. So in the neighborhood, in the community, were created parallel institutions, parallel economic, parallel political. And since the community was created, except unless you wanted to have a fight or something, going out to the community, made your money outside, brought it inside. And the dollar turned around three or four times. I never had to work outside the, the black belt until I, well, I left and went to Milwaukee trying to escape the draft, but I wasn't successful. But, um, it, uh, but the dollar circulated. Now, this, this it can be indicated by what happened, China, the Chinatown. Of this country. The dollar circulates around in the Chinatown four or five times. In the Jewish community, that dollar circulates even with the integration, that dollar circulates. So the example that I use in terms of the Great Migration, the first Great Migration, is to illustrate the drive, the incentives, the opportunity, and all of those things that they took care and they let them tell it in their own way. And uh, some people tell me that the stories are quite interesting. And I hope that you look at a book, Bridges of Memory, and uh, see if you like it. And one day when, when I can, when you want me to, I'll sign those books if you wish. I've been lucky. That's just a sample of a few. That's, that's outdated now. I mean, those places have almost doubled or tripled. I'll be going out of the, out of the state uh, very, very soon in terms of uh, the demand to come and give lectures. And, uh, I think I'll be in Houston in early February. And um, so I feel good because I've had young men and women like yourself, black and white, to give me encouragement and had the opportunity to have a major university like Northwestern to uh, back this up because I couldn't have done it. I insisted, as did the original uh, editor chief of Northwestern, that we have a black collaborator, and that's where the museum, uh, the New South Museum comes in, because we want to show some unity about this issue beyond just the racial aspect. Of it. But we also want to indicate that does have race in it. Because without exception, when these successful people like a Jewel Stratford, I have to go step by step with this one, Jewel Stratford, Ro Rogers, no, Jewel Stratford, Rogers, La Fontaine, Mad Cario, <laughs> who became the Solicitor General to the President of the United States whose parents had to leave Tulsa, Oklahoma because they burned them out in the 1923 race riot, as well as John Hope Franklin's father, who was a lawyer. They come to Chicago, and they do very well. She is the first black woman to graduate, she had her degree before, but she was the first black woman to graduate from the law school at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> but even despite having accomplished all this and wanting to be in the mainstream, she is reminded fairly regularly that she is a black woman. I suspect that even with all the success that Oprah Winfrey had, if she didn't announce she was Oprah Winfrey, she would be reminded in various ways that she was a black woman. Uh, the late doctor, I forget his name, theologian. Oh, God. He was at Howard. He was everywhere. I can't remember his name. But anyway, he was at the university. He wrote a, he, he wrote a, a, a um, paper saying God put Howard Thurman. God put Negroes in America to prove whether democracy could work or not. <laughs> if it cannot work without people having to change their color, 
If it could not work for those people, eventually it would not work for anyone. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now our responsibility to our future, your particularly you young people, is to prove that it can work. That's what Dr. King was trying to do, that's what others are trying to do. If it can't work for us, it will not work. And that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of a negative thing, but I take it from a positive thing, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here at 85. I'd be out golfing somewhere. <laughs> so I hope to see, and maybe we can have some comments and questions. I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. I, I was asked to talk about my research, and I just have so many works in progress. Um, my books were going to be my children, and a lot of them have been stillborn. Um, but I'm at the point that, like now, I'm trying to push them all out. So I'm working on them simultaneously. That most of my earlier research and publications were in biography. I'm the official biographer of R.R. Wright Sr. from Georgia and people from Atlanta. Uh, um, 1855, 1947, and I've done extensive work and publication on Lucy Craft Laney, also of Georgia, and Fanny Berry Williams from uh, New York, then Chicago, and et cetera. Um, that's not what I want to talk to you about today, though, but I, uh, so for the benefit of those who don't know what I'm talking about, R.R. R. Wright was born in um, Cuthbert, Georgia, in um, 1855. He died in 1947. He was in the first graduating class from Atlanta University, that is the BA degrees, uh, because the first class to graduate from Atlanta were women. And the person who graduated at the top of that class was Lucy Craft Laney. That's how I got interested in Laney when I had done my dissertation on Wright. And I came across Laney and she was fascinating, et cetera. Fanny Barrier Williams, by the other hand, was born in Brockport, New York, 1855, died in 1944. Uh, my connection with her was studying the situation here with the, the black women trying to get the pavilion for the World's Fair. And then I found out about her. She was the first black woman appointed to the Chicago Library Board. She was active in the club movement. And her and Ida B. Wells clashed, even though when they first came here, her husband worked in Ida B. Wells' husband's law office. So I, that, I backed in, in, into that kind of thing. Um, but I am, I'm, what I want to, and I brought both the formal and the informal, and I'm going to check the votes on mm -hmm. I'm long-winded, so I jot it down, um, um, what I wanted to talk about. I thought that, well, works in progress includes a thing that I call Miss Anne and Mandingo, which is a study of the situation between white women and black men in antebellum South. I'm going to talk about that now. Um, what I do want to talk about is what I call the Black Mammy uh, Memorial Movement. In 1980, I, when I was doing something else, I came across a document at the University of Georgia about a school that was started in Anthens, Georgia in 1910. And I thought it was an isolated incident, so I just published it as a, as a document. Uh, it's called the Old Black Mammy Memorial Institute. And then in the course of doing research for other things, I kept coming across these different articles and documents related to and it became clear to me that this wasn't an isolated incident, that it was part of a movement. And so what I want to talk about is a, a briefly the, the 1890s. Um, the 1890s is an extremely interesting and important period in American history in general and black history in particular because it represents a watershed in a lot of different respects. Um, John Ho Franklin uh, uh, said once that if Reconstruction was about northernizing the South, then by the 1890s, the South had southernized the nation. And I think it's a little bit overstated in the sense that it wasn't just the influence of the, 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 this, the uh, what do they call it, the triumph of white supremacy, but also the character of what was going on worldwide, the, the, the new American imperialism and that the justification being based on race to a large extent when we moved into uh, uh, Philippines and Cuba and Hawaii and places where they were non-white people. Then as the New York Times said at the time, how can we attack Mississippi for the treatment of blacks and justify what we're doing in, in Cuba, you know, kind of thing. So that the, there became a homogenization of attitudes in, in, in the country. but. There was a long, I'm trying to, I don't want to go too fast, so if I go, do it slowly now. 
and I don't want to go too far back, but there's been there's a protracted struggle that uh, between the North and the South that started in the very early colonial period um, because you had developing two distinct and different societies, one becoming commercial and, and, and industrial, and the other becoming a, a, an increasingly agrarian. That most of us know about the so-called struggle between the section of the sexual strife um, that usually came about when there was new acquisition of territory and et cetera. Well, connected with that economic and political struggle, there was also a cultural struggle. Though the conservative right seems to claim that struggle of culture, the cultural struggle being contemporary, it's been an ongoing characteristic of American society. And that, so Reconstruction, which uh, officially uh, ends in, in 1877, um, but then it was in the 1890s that you have uh, the triumph of white supremacy, okay? In between, what's apparent about the watershed nature of the 1890s, and I'll throw it all out here at the, one is you have the triumph of white supremacy. You know what I'm talking about, right? So I don't have to plan. You also have the emergence and institutionalization of segregation and discrimination with so-called Jim Crow laws. You had uh, uh, the official uh, uh, recognition of, of segregation uh, in it predating the Plessy case, the, the Merrill Act of 1892, when the government said providing separate institutions would constitute applying to the law, and then clearly in 1896 with the Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, so you have that sanction. Then you have the new American imperialism. And then you have the emergence of Booker T. Washington and the notion of, of self-help, which had always been there, but that just got codified in, in that period. Now, if Reconstruction was not just about the social and economic, but also the culture, then the redemption had a cultural dimension as well. Um, it's sort of like uh, uh, they were willing to accept the New South. Remember that notion of the New South? But they realized they wanted the old Negro or what they referred to as the uh, uh, the newspaper talked about it as the old issue darkies, you know, that what they were complaining about, not only the question of good help is hard to find, but that they were also concerned about the character and behavior of the quote unquote Negro. Uh, they weren't doing what they had, what they were told. They put their own interests above that of white people. They weren't respectful, like stepping off the street, off the corner and stuff, that they were getting out of hand, and they longed for the good old days, okay? So that part of what comes in the 1890s is a recreation of the good old days in the literature, the poetry, the plays, the music, uh, and et cetera. And you have to understand that people don't operate in terms of what is, and they don't operate in terms of what should be. They operate in terms of perception. And it doesn't matter whether it's true or, or, or not, that people have to be understood in the context of how they perceived things, because this is the way they iterate, okay? And so in the South, you have these people recreating the good old days, and nothing uh, exemplified the good old days more than the faithful slave. It answered the question of the bad behavior, new Negro. It addressed the question of regaining control of the history and interpretation of what was good or the good old South. So that you begin to have this massive body of literature and plays and music. Uh, and part of that whole thing was a movement to erect monuments to faithful slaves. Now this wasn't new, one of the earliest I found uh, it was in the 1830s, but what happened is these were private kind of things, like a faithful servant uh, might be buried in the family plot and a little memorial put up for them, et cetera. But in the 1890s, these become public affairs, that they put parks, and et cetera, and there was a massive movement by organizations and government agencies to create monuments for those slaves that had remained faithful uh, during the war and that still cared about the well-being of the master, put their be well-being ahead of, of their own, and et cetera. In other words, the idealized slave, okay? And they got very creative with some of these things, you know. Um, some of them had certain benefits, like a, a Tennessee uh, introduced a, a part of the legislation of the pension, 
that slaves that had gone off to war with their masters and served to the end get a $10 a month pension. Um, in Texas, there was legislation introduced that said they were going to set up a, a, a home for old uh, faithful slaves. I don't know how that was going to be determined, but it, didn't, it never got off the calendar anyway. But that, that, then there were these parks that were being established, and et cetera. The first national movement for a faithful slave monument, ironically, was Harper's Ferry. And it was for Haywood uh, a Shepherd, who was the uh, night watchman or the, the luggage man that got the first person that got killed when James, uh, John Brown, I'm sorry to say James Brown, <laughs> when John <laughs> Brown and invaded Harper's Ferry. So uh, this was picked up by the Daughters of the Confederacy and et cetera, and, and they began to uh, erect these monuments, and, 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 and some of them were very creative and introduced legislation for homes and pensions and, and et cetera. The Mammy movement was part and parcel of that movement. And, and, and in fact, the first monument that, that, that uh, one of the most uh, important monuments uh, came about 1895 in uh, Fort Mill, South Carolina. And what was unique about this is that it combined public and private in that uh, uh, Captain, uh, what was his name? Uh, Elliot is his last name, Captain Elliot uh, build a monument for the faithful slaves, the pe slaves that had been faithful to his family, and he lists their names. There were six of them. But the monument was put in a public park. It was called the uh, Confederate Park. And he also integrated the faithful slave in the Mammy, in that on the, it looked like a, a miniature uh, copy of the Washington Monument with five-step base. And on the east side, it had a picture of Mammy sitting on, in, on the porch of the big house with a white baby in her arm. And on the, on the west side, it had Tom sitting in the field on the fence with a, 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 a grain saw kind of thing. And then he had the faithful slaves listed. And this was in 1895. Then you have uh, uh, this movement begins to separate. They're, begin, they're, they're both going on simultaneously, but you have this separate movement going on to create these mammy movements. And there are a lot, one of the things that, 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 that I found very, very curious uh, when I ran across it is, okay, slavery ended, Reconstruction was over. If all this endearment of the mammy, why, what's this big gap? You know, how do you explain this, this, this big gap in between there? And there are a lot of things, and I'll come back and talk about some if I have time. But I do want to give you some ideas of, of some of the, by the way, I probably need to come, though I concentrate on the South, Ironically, it wasn't just a Southern thing. In fact, in 1903, uh, the, the, the people of um, uh, Burlington, uh, Rhode Island, um, built a monument to the slaves that had been faithfully serving the residents of Burlington. And, and, and also the uh, Daughters of the Confederacy in Chicago, Chicago chapter, uh, made this tremendous commitment to build monuments in every southern city uh, for, for the faithful slaves. So, so that even though we tend to talk about uh, of being a southern thing, it was taking place in, on, on, on different levels around the country. Some of these things were very creative, and I think I wanted to just talk about a few that, that, that were uh, uh, very creative. The one that I started with that initially uh, introduced me to the topic, the Old Black Mammy Memorial Institute, was been in Athens, Georgia, built in Athens, Georgia, in, in 1910. And what happened is that apparently in, in the 1890s, uh, there had been a movement in Texas uh, to do something for the Mammy. And they had done some things, and the people in Athens, Georgia, had gotten wind of it, and they said they wanted to do something. And that what they, but they argued that they didn't want to have concrete, cold steel, they wanted a living, vibrant monument. So they said, what could be better than a school that would instill in the young people the ideas and the values of the old black mammy? <laughs> so this school was not only going to train these people in industrial work and et cetera, but it was going to instill these values of the old time darky, you know, kind of thing. It also had a lot to do with the shortage of good health. You know, that, that, that the practicality went in there at the same time. Um, there were some things that 
and something that was one of the most creative but there were other things that were, that were done that would have been excuse me some of them are funny like in St. Louis by 1915 they had an annual Mammy Day and, and, and what Mammy Day was that the women in the town would dress up in the costumes of the 1860s and uh, former mammies or the children of mammies would come and wait on them and the highlight of the day is that they would get to read a genuine, original, pure mammy. <laughs> you know, and then and that way and it was in the paper. It was the you know, and they invited people like the daughters of the Confederacy and uh, all of the aristocrats and this was a, a high thing, a Mammy Day. Um, in Nashville, Tennessee, they had something a little more practical.